Hello everyone, happy Earth Day, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Decarbonizing Maritime Transportation in the Supply Chain. My name is Nina Kaladin, and I'm a Senior Climate Program Manager at Flexport. Today, I'll be talking to experts in the field on different pathways for reducing maritime emissions. Before we begin, let's cover a few housekeeping items. On your screen, you'll see a sidebar to the right of the main stage. If at any time you need assistance during the live webinar, please message us in the help chat. You can also ask questions via the Q&A tab in the sidebar. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar and at the end of the panel, we'll work to answer them. We'll also drop a link to the slides in the chat at the conclusion of today's webinar. A brief legal note, please keep in mind that all the information in this session is based on the current situation and may not be customized to your specific business requirements. Please reach out to us if you have further questions. Now, joining me today are three individuals I'm excited to introduce. Meta Esmussen leads the maritime sector initiatives at the World Economic Forum, focusing on industry decarbonization within the shipping sector as part of the Center for Nature and Climate. With a background at Maersk and years of public sector experience in Denmark, and at the Danish Embassy in Washington, DC, Meta drives initiatives like the First Movers Coalition to accelerate the adoption of alternative fuels and procurement strategies. Next, Jan Kristoff Napierski is the head of public affairs at the Merce McKinney Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping, also known as the Center, whose mission is to drive collaboration towards achieving global zero carbon shipping by 2050. Jan Kristoff has over 15 years of policymaking and diplomatic experience from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark to NATO and the European Parliament. Last but not least is Flexport's very own Trina Nielsen. Trina is a seasoned leader in the logistics and supply chain sector, starting her career at Maersk. Trina joined Flexport a bit over a year ago as our head of ocean in the EMEA region and leverages her experience in logistics and digital transformation to drive our company's growth in the region. A warm welcome and thanks to our panelists. We're thrilled for the opportunity to talk to you today. And with that, here's today's agenda. Over the next hour, we'll explore the driving forces behind shipper interest in sustainability, dive into the complexities of emissions measurement and decarbonization efforts in the maritime sector, and discuss the regulatory landscape that is shaping the industry's future. We'll also highlight options for cargo buyers to take action to reduce emissions, address the practical aspects of operating a truly sustainable supply chain, and emphasize the importance of collaboration and accountability. A bit more on why we're here today. The maritime industry stands at the forefront of global trade. Conversely, it's one of the most difficult sectors to decarbonize. Reducing emissions in the transportation sector is critical to mitigating climate change. To begin our panel, I'd love to start with a hopefully straightforward question. What is driving shipper interest in sustainability? Trina, I'll direct this one to you. Thank you and thank you for inviting me in, Nina. I'm really uh, happy to be here on Earth Day talking about sustainability. And when you say it's a pretty straightforward uh, question, um, I kind of tend to disagree, but that is because when talking to customers, uh, every day here in Flexport, I think there's such a big variance in terms of, of the sustainability agenda. We see companies who are sustainability led, and then we see companies who uh, are in a state where basically cost is, uh, is the driving factor in, the, in their decision making. Um, there's no right or wrongs, uh, you know, all companies are in their own context uh, and have their own strategies, so, uh, so we will not be the, the judges of that. Um, but the good news is that at least if you ask majority of uh, companies, everyone is interested in a sustainable solution, at least depending on the cost. So uh, I thought for today we could look at, because we have done a few surveys in some of the webinars that we've done here in, uh, in Flexport, but just to highlight and bring a little bit of data to the table in terms of, uh, of what our customers tell, uh, tell us. Um, so if we shift to the next uh, slide, here we can see responses respectively from a North American webinar and from a European uh, webinar. Um, and responses are actually quite similar. 
majority of respondents say that sustainability is a great solution, but it also very much depends on the cost. Very few companies are still willing to pay an additional cost uh, for sustainability. Um, and I think overall, the context of each company is, uh, is of course, what needs to matter here. Consumer behaviors, the industry that companies are in, so also the competitive environment will to a very large extent still drive the, the shipper demand. So I'm also curious to hear because I know Meta and Jan Christoph uh, sit and look a lot at this also in a, in a global perspective. And I, of course, uh, sit and talk to our European customers a lot. But I'm also curious to hear what your take is because uh, do, are we seeing regional differences? Are we seeing differences based on uh, on industries or what is your experience in terms of how shippers are navigating this uh, space at the moment? I'm happy to come in here and, and firstly uh, thank you so much for the invite to be here today and, uh, and share the, that uh, share the testament of being here on Earth Day is, is definitely an important uh, an important message. Um, so I think actually I want to look at it a little bit different than the regional differences. Uh, so, so there might well be regional differences. Uh, they're not as significant as the as the differences that you will see across the different segments. So, if you just look in shipping specifically, we we talk about shipping decarbonization, but reality probably is that there is decarbonization of the container segment, decarbonization of the bulk segment, of the car carrier, and and, and of the of the tanker segments. Uh, and then obviously also uh, within uh, within the container segments, you have different types of customers. I think it all comes down to the willingness to pay exactly. Um, but then on the other side, also the how quick can we scale up the production to actually bring down the cost of, of the fuels? Um, so there's there's many there's many layers and and uh, and aspects of 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 willingness to pay and and which segments to look at. Uh, if you if from my perspective. And Meta, where do you primarily see that demand signal coming from? Is it usually from the cargo owners or is there fuel production kind of spurring along the cargo owners to take action? I think it's quite uh, scattered across the value chain. I think you'll definitely, you will you, definitely see that quite some container um, um, owners has, has, has gone ahead and invested in, in vessels, but you also see it in, 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 other, in other segments within shipping. Uh, and at the same time, it's kind of the same pattern within fuel that, uh, that there are investments being made, but it's not scalable uh, uh, at this uh, at this point yet. Uh, so, and I, I would love to come back to that later, but that might be for later in the discussion on how do we then how do, how do we then address the, that scalability within the supply of maritime fuels as well. Absolutely, and I know that's at the core of the First Movers Coalition, so we'll absolutely talk about that a little bit later. Um, Jan Christoph, I know this is part of the center's work um, and taking a bit of a step back, how, um, how are maritime emissions measured in transportation today? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, there is different models to measure uh, emissions today, and especially those when you look at uh, the official ones from public side, uh, you got measurements by MO, you got measurements, for instance, also on a regional level uh, by the European Union. Uh, and then you have um, initiatives by, by some companies. But you know, there is not like one single model of measuring emissions globally yet. Actually, that's a work ongoing at the International Maritime Organization. So that's also some element, one element that makes it a bit more difficult to compare and also to introduce like one, one model uh, that would make easier for customers to see, okay, if I invest in this product uh, and use this label, then actually I can make sure that it's zero emissions or close to zero emissions all the way through. Um, I think it's, it's very encouraging that uh, your, your customers are ready to pay uh, up to 10% or even more than 10%. Uh, and that's also something we see. There is more and more customers ready to pay, depends on the product. That's a very positive signal. Still, one thing is like the opinion poll. Another thing is uh, standing there and actually with a credit card, should I pay the 10% more or, or, or not? Uh, there we still actually see, see quite some uh, difficulties to really engage in the process. But first thing here is the readiness to do it. That's already quite quite positive to see. And I guess one of the challenges that we see today is that the additional cost that you have to pay for some of these solutions out there are still so relatively high. Um, and like, I would assume that looking into 2024 and beyond, if we 
if we see an economic downturn, uh, probably, uh, you know, a lot of people will actually move towards not being willing to pay simply because the additional profit is not available uh, to sustain this. But it also means that we're in sort of a, a vicious circle. Um, so I'm just curious here because, like, how do you see when you look at these things, uh, because you look at it every day, how far are we from a sustainable sort of competitive uh, alternative on uh, on maritime fuel. Oh wow! Uh, I can I can go first and then Madeline. <laughs> um, there is there's quite a gap if we want to look at like global shipping and global maritime sector. Uh, so um, the fuel cost price gap is depending on the solution you would like to choose quite significant. It might be cheaper in, depending on where you are in the world what you would like to ship, how long a distance you would like to, to work with. Uh, it might be uh, higher or lower for some of the fuels, maybe a bit lower for some of the biofuels if you're in a region where there is a lot of biofuel available, sustainable uh, biofuels. Uh, and it might be more expensive if you look at uh, the e-fuels, uh, especially for the e-fuels, you still have a very, very significant price cost gap. And uh, that needs to be closed, uh, not only through customer, as, uh, but also uh, through an approach where we look at how to bring in the public side with uh, regulation, uh, both on uh, the emissions, how to measure them, but also uh, very much if uh, also from public side, there can be co contribution to cl close the fuel cost price gap, but also the additional costs laying behind on the land side, especially for uh, investments in infrastructure. And maybe I could just add to that. So as a, as a rule of thumb, we usually say that it's at least three to four times more expensive as, as uh, Jan Christoph uh, also alluded to here. There's there's many different pathways for many different types of fuels. It's not we're not looking into a one fuel taking over for uh, current fossil fuel. It's what we would usually refer to as a multi fuel future. Reality is also that some of these fuels are not even available today. Um, some of them are still in testing mode in in, in terms of, uh, of of the engines. Uh, and then the scalability of the fuel side. And if I just touch it quickly, touch quickly on on that side, um, there's almost two things there. And there's a price gap between what is the producers willing to produce this fuel at, and what are the off takers, uh, in the sense of the ones that are going to put fuel on the vessels, willing to buy it at. And so we we need to address two things to bring that gap closer. We need to uh, make sure we get economies of scale. On the production side, so you actually bring uh, bring bring down the price of, of producing this fuel, and then you need to bring up the willingness to pay uh, um, uh, on the on, on on the on the fuel uptake uptaker side. Um, and 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 here, as Jan Christoph says, uh, there's uh, there's a there's a number of different mechanisms. There's the re regulatory side. There's the role of uh, of the demand signals. There's the role of 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 starting to move ahead with some of these, but also just the capacity of of the infrastructure to fuel the vessels um, uh, and the investment um, capacity to actually invest in some of these plants. Uh, so uh, to produce methanol uh, or, or ammonia, these are not short-term de uh, investment decisions. These are long-term investment decisions that are uh, that require uh, require quite some certainty on the offtake or the, the revenue that, uh, that it's going to generate. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And we've just started to talk on this point a little bit, um, but I would love to ask kind of in depth, what options are currently available for cargo buyers to decarbonize today? Yeah, well, we I, I could go first, then, please, please, but I can just, just a few points uh, there. When looking at uh, the alternatives uh, you have as a cargo buyer, well, um, things are beginning. When we look back uh, three years in time, it was entirely different. Actually, it was not too many possibilities to, to go and buy a, a, a green uh, transportation uh, uh, for your, your cargo. Today, that looks different already. You see some first movers, uh, for instance, uh, Merska out there, but also a number of others who uh, offer this possibility, MSC and, and, and others. Um, and we see quite a good development that actually more and more are getting ready uh, to uh, engage in this. Um, still, it is 
few first movers offering this. It's not that we see like the fast followers already uh, engaging or, or the wider community. This is very much we are in the beginning of, of a journey here. Um, the uh, vision is to, to have a kind of solution that would be uh, something that would fit everybody who would like to see uh, the goods transported in a, in a green way, like you see, for instance, fair trade label. If you could have such a label that would also make it visible for the customer, if you put that on uh, a pair of shoes or on some other cargo and you can certify it the whole way through, that would make it much, much easier. As the situation is right now, it is not something that is widely available uh, for, for uh, cargo buyers. but it's a quite positive development that we see for a number of companies and here also especially world economic forum and, and meta play an important role over to you yeah and I, I i can just add on that in terms of the the fast followers i always talk about that one thing is to have first movers in an industry uh, that are moving willing to lean in and buy order vessels even though it's not the, the norm yet and customers uh, at the end that are willing to pay for, for their cargo going on a vessel that sails on biofuel or uh, well, methanol soon also. Um, but the transition or the, the, the tipping point is really not going to be reached if you don't have those fast followers. The fast followers are really what's, what's going to enable the, the broader transition to, to take place um, in order to actually create those economies of scale uh, that, that, that are, are needed for on the supply side. Uh, you do need a quite critical mass uh, and a quite critical uh, demand signal um, uh, for that. Um, so, so one thing that actually also excites me on by where where, can, where action be, can can be taken today is some of these uh, um, unusual ways of doing procurement. So unconventional partnerships across the value chain. Uh, you see some of them going together in in very concrete uh, bias clubs. So zero emission bias alliance. Uh, just uh, announced uh, during Singapore Maritime Week uh, their first RFP uh, on, on 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 moving X amount of, of goods on um uh, on on fuels on uh, on biofuel I think it ended up being but with a ninety three percent reduction so so th those are good steps uh, these are all mechanisms that are probably going to be transitory uh, um, but that are needed in order to rethink a little bit on how do we uh, uh, how do we really fast fastest transition to, to, to zero emission. And, and that's also where Flexport plays a quite critical role as a consolidator um, and, and can really benefit or can really use that role also very actively in the sustainability transition. Um, yeah, Gina, I'd love to hear a bit more from you on how Flexport plays exactly that role. Yeah, so um, one of the things now that we have uh, biofuel available, that's of course something that we can also uh, pass on to uh, to our customers. Uh, so that's one thing that we are looking at uh, in the more short term. Um, for the more sort of medium to long term, one of the things that we are actively looking into with our technology and data capabilities is to is to try and understand how we can also um, move our goods in the least uh, or in the most sustainable uh, matter, because we know what ships are sailing. Uh, what are we, uh, you know, what is the CO2 emission uh, on, a, on a per ship level? It is something where we feel that over time using the data, we can also start rewarding um, carriers who have uh, more sustainable solutions, which is to me, because when we talk about this, like if, if you have to pay a large add on for a sustainable model today, it is something that would be a barrier to companies, uh, especially low margin companies. And I don't think anyone one is interested in uh, bankrupting uh, companies. Um, so we're also really trying to think creatively about how can we help uh, push this, but at a very minimal if if any cost uh, simply through the way that we work with uh, our partners behind the scenes it sounds easy but uh, it's not as easy uh, as it uh, sounds trying to combine all the, the information about the ships around the world and what they are emitting in terms of uh, of uh, co2 and fuel um, but at least it's uh, it's one of the steps that we can take as a, as a company and then of course nina you uh, represent the dot org uh, uh, part of our company, which I think has a uh, has a big impact both uh, short and uh, long term. So uh, even though you're the facilitator, maybe you can just share quickly what you are looking at. 
Absolutely. And so Flexport.org, as Trina just mentioned, is our dedicated sustainability and impact team here at Flexport. And our goal is to really try and incorporate impact throughout people's supply chain planning. And so a lot of the work that my team does is help the businesses that we work with understand their footprint from transportation and find those ways to reduce and take action. So whether it's consolidations or modality switches or something that I'll ask shortly about insetting and the booking claim for low carbon fuels. Um, it's all the ways that today we're trying to find those solutions. So um, while we wait for the technologies in our industry to continue to develop so we can all take action around decarbonizing transportation and specifically maritime transportation that we're able to take action today. And so with that, I just mentioned some, I would say industry buzzwords, including book and claim, in setting and then green corridors. I would also love to ask John Kristoff because I know the center's work has done a lot in this space to tell us a little bit about um, those three topic areas. Yes, absolutely. And um, going to, to that, I think also what is important to, to highlight um, is uh, how we actually uh, we touch upon how we measure emissions. You know, there's I, I touch upon the different uh, uh, views how to do that, um, but that also inevitably has quite a lot of consequences uh, for uh, something like, for instance, a book and claim system at the end, um, because um, uh, the book and claim system uh, that uh, could be one solution to address the problem uh, of uh, demand. Uh, goes actually in the direction of not being forced to move the very, very costly uh, alternative fuels to the place where you would like to use them, which in itself also can be costly. So it's a, the basic idea is to decouple uh, the fuel from the emissions and um, then uh, to be able to uh, produce and use alternative fuels in one part of the world. And then if you want to, uh, in one other part of the world where you do not have this fuel available, but you would like to pay the additional uh, cost in order to, to avoid CO2 emissions, you actually can pay uh, the sum for the emission-free alternative fuels uh, and declare that towards your customers, while then in the other part of the world, uh, they would not be able to, to use that advantage. So the decoupling of costs from, from the fuels is the basic idea uh, behind the book and claim system. And it should help in a transitional phase uh, to accumulate and, and gather a larger demand for alternative fuels. And that is actually one of the big problems that, that we see uh, today. You know, if you just go three, back years, uh, three years back in time, um, then we had the big problem of chicken or egg. Is actually uh, the fuel the biggest challenge here or the vessels, the demand on the other side? And uh, the ship owners told uh, uh, the ports and fuel owners, uh, we would love to sail to your port and we would love to sail uh, on alternative fuels. Just make sure that the, the fuel we need is in your port. And the fuel producer said, well, we would love to produce all the fuel. Just make sure that the ship owners and ships come to the places where we are. Uh, so now things have changed quite a lot because in the past years, now we've seen uh, a demand uh, growing and growing because there is, for instance, more than 200 dual fuel methanol ships on order globally. Uh, three years ago, that was close to zero. Uh, we actually also now see the first orders for ammonia dual fuel ships. Uh, so a lot is happening there. And just uh, the fir first 13 green methanol ships of, of Maersk, they would actually suck up all the alternative energy of Denmark if they, that should be produced in Denmark, just to tell a bit about the volumes and amounts needed to supply these ships. So in order to get the production going, what we see right now is some of the large first movers, they actually are sourcing fuels, they are entering into contracts, but that's you know, the beginning. In order to establish platforms, multi fuel platforms in many ports that many different ship owners actually could profit off, we need again also here uh, the fast followers uh, uh, to come. But to me, the demand is growing out there. Uh, so the big challenge is actually on the land side. And um, collected, uh, connected to this problem, just one number, uh, in our perspective, um, if you want to decarbonize the maritime sector, 20% of your investments are on the seaside. 
80% of the investments are on the land side. And also there, actually, the long-term investments are needed. And it takes quite a lot, a lot of time to get ready to produce the fuels needed. Um, so that is uh, clearly the, the biggest challenge here in order to produce the fuels needed to decarbonize and also accommodate the wishes by the customer uh, to, to save, for instance, on green fuels. Thank you, Jan Christoph. I know another way to take action that we've all talked about in the past is through demand aggregation. And Meta, I would love to have you share a bit more on your work with the First Movers Coalition. Thanks. So, yeah, the concept with the First Movers Coalition is really how do you how do you aggregate and use the power of uh, the power of procurement. So when we launched First Moors Coalition uh, in 21 at the, at COP, um, it was the idea of, of really uh, using the power of some of the biggest companies in the world uh, and actively using that procurement power to bring forward low carbon technologies. Uh, so First Moors Coalition actually is a what I'll call a multi-sectoral uh, um, initiative. It covers seven different sectors, including shipping as one of them. Uh, and that has a lot of strengths, the fact that it covers more sectors than, than just one. It amounts to around 100 companies now across those seven sectors. So from the transport sectors, it's uh, aviation, shipping and trucking. Um, so all the models that are that are important for the customers. Um, shipping uh, is 17 customers. And just to deep dive a little bit without be without it becoming too technical on the on the on the mechanism, uh, essentially, uh, the idea is to, to send a demand signal from the cargo owner side. So we have uh, members such as uh, Amazon um, from the cargo owner side that they will be buying uh, goods that go on zero emission uh, vessels. So there's a commitment there to move 10% uh, before 2030 um, from the cargo owners that are part of this. Uh, and then that commitment goes over the value chain to the ship owners committing to moving um, by 2030, they will be using 5% of the of the fuel uh, that go on their vessel as zero emission uh, fuels. So these are these are quite ambitious targets actually. And also, when you look at where is the um, or commitments, where where is the um, where is the technology going? But the whole idea behind it is exactly that that technology is not going to develop that fast on its own. So we we usually look at it as uh, for a lot of these technologies that are needed, and it's, uh, for shipping, it's mostly hydrogen-derived uh, technologies. Um, they're not at commercialization stage yet. They are in the stage in phase two, what we usually call the valley of death. So phase one being a demonstration phase, phase three really being a commercialization. But we need to bring them over that valley of death. Uh, and, and that's where a lot of these, uh, including regulatory framework, um, um, other uh, green corridors, which uh, the the center is working on, but but the demand signals as well can really can really help on, and the the, the clear commitment from the first movers that they are willing to actually um, help bring these technologies over the valley of death into the commercialization stage. Commercialization stage is where it becomes really interesting, right? Because that's where we can then drive economies of scale, uh, drive down the cost, become much more. Um, uh, accessible across and really get those fast followers activated. Um, so there's also, I also look at some of these companies that are really taking some brave moves without necessarily knowing how is the, how is the future going to, uh, going to look like. Um, but I think for once in the shipping industry, we, we also really see uh, a situation where um, thinking out of the box is, uh, is, 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 is necessary, not just thinking out of the container box, but just thinking, broadly across of how can we actually do things in a little bit of different way. Um, and I think if you don't just look at the cargo on how do you how do you move your goods around, but on the on the how do shipping companies or trucking companies or ship aviation, there's a lot of things in the procurement functions that are changing from going out and buying volume and quant volume and price, but also looking at uh, at other characteristics. And, and it, to some extent, instead of making it um, short-term deci uh, decision, it becomes long-term strategic procurement decisions. So there's a lot of things that are changing in the industry uh, right now. And I think one of the things that we're then trying to also um, to take synergies out of is, is working across some of the sectors. Um, because First Moves Coalition cover different sectors, uh, how can we both learn from the different sectors, but also how can we um, how can we scale that supply side by also looking at multi uh, multi 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 sector offtake? Uh, so if you're a supplier of, of some of these fuels for, for the shipping sector, um, it can it's quite 
it's it, it can be quite daunting to only have one sector as your uh, potential customer um so so the certainty of knowing that if you invest in a fuel plant uh, there will be other sectors that are that that, that will be potential customers um, and i think that's that that's something that goes across uh, not all the way from cargo owner and all the way to the producer of, of fuels that we need to think a little bit more uh, outside the box, uh, uh, unconventional partnerships, uh, and actually thinking about how do we how do we absorb that sustainability across the, the value chain and and which challenges are each uh, each component in the in the value chain faced with. Thank you. Um, looking forward, I know we've talked a little bit today on just how much has changed in the past even three years. We could say five years within maritime decarbonization. Um, what can we expect in the next two to three years? One area I know we could have a whole nother webinar is on regulation, but Jan Christoph, I would love to kind of hear where you see regulation moving in the short term and how it will affect our industry. Yes, thank you very much. And, and also on the regulatory side, there is happening quite a lot. Uh, so the big landmark was last year, International Maritime Organization under the United Nations um, to agree on a new revised climate strategy. And for the first time defining that the target now is a decarbonization of the whole maritime sector by around 2050. Before that, you could actually, uh, as a, a ship owner, for instance, fulfill the IMO targets with good energy efficiency measures because the target was 50% in 2050. So you could stick to fossil, use energy efficiency and still make it to the bridge, the 50%. Now everybody knows they need to go in the direction of zero. And in this agreement that actually was a unanimous agreement by the countries in London at the time, uh, we also see an interesting target of five, striving to 10% of alternative fuels by 2030. And we see also very interesting uh, targets of, on, of milestones on the pathway to 2050, the 20 to 30 uh, percent emission reduction 2030 or 70 to 80 and uh, 70 to 80 percent of emission reduction by 2040. Um, so that also helps to frame uh, a little bit the context for customers, but also fuel producers, ship owners, uh, where we are uh, the next years. And we hope to see that next year at IMO, there will be an agreement on main elements below this target, which means that there will be an agreement on a global fuel standard and actually how to reduce the emissions towards 2050, that there will be an agreement on some kind of economic element that would be helped to incentivize not only buying a dual fuel ship, but also producing alternative fuels on the land side and go the green way also as a customer. And not at least also an agreement on how you measure your emissions, because uh, uh, it's actually until now, there is, as I mentioned, no, no clear standard on how you define your emissions. And what is even more important, it's, it's uh, not integrating the land side. Right now, IMO is only looking at the seaside, only looking at what comes out of uh, the funnel uh, of your ship, not uh, actually where emissions on the land side come from, because that was not of interest um, as long as it was fossil. Now, with e-fuels especially, you need to look at how do I actually produce the electricity for my alternative fuels? Is it a wind turbine or is it actually a coal plant? And that makes a, an enormous difference uh, when calculating uh, the overall emissions. Then on the other side, we see globally not only the work at IMO, we also have seen a few EU and uh, EU ETS implemented now and adopted in the European Union, which has very, very uh, large consequences for the whole maritime sector, not at least also the customers here. And we also see initiatives, for instance, in the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act incentivizing going the green way uh, for the fuel producers. So according to some calculation in the center, if you actually put together what we see in the European Union today, both with the fuel EU, but also with the European uh, Emission Trading Scheme and the IRA, actually, in some cases, you can already look at uh, some cases where you are almost ready to close the fuel cost price gap if you also see some some customer incentives here so a lot happening out there and this is a window of opportunity that we need to make use of because if we don't get things right the next two years 
then it will be extremely difficult to reach the targets uh, of 2030, both for the fuel production and the emission reduction at IMO, and it will be even more difficult to reach the decarbonization of the sector by, by 2050. Thank you. Trina, I would love to ask, how do you see technology playing a role in our upcoming transition in the next few years? Yeah, so I think technology will hopefully help us do a lot of things better. Um, I think one of the, the big topics around, uh, you know, emissions, as you talked about, is if we can't measure it, how can we then act on it? Um, I think technology can be a very big helper in terms of making sure that we, um, that we uh, you know, have the right baselines in place. But I also see a lot of benefit in terms of using technology better to forecast. Um, there's a lot of waste in the system in the shipping industry, and there's a lot of behaviors around that also in terms of how to plan capacity and where do we put uh, these things. Uh, or where do we where do we deploy ships from a carrier perspective? And I think um, if we can optimize somehow, uh, you know, how much fuel is being used, basically by being better at topics like forecasting, um, that can that can help quite a lot. So I think technology will probably uh, come in unexpected ways. That's sort of my, uh, you know, take on it. I feel like the the shipping industry, as such, has not seen the full, um, the full impact of how technology can transform uh, an industry. Uh, and probably, you know, I don't come from a technology background, uh, so I always try to be very humble in terms of saying there's a lot of people out there with great ideas, and I'm sure, like the platform thinking about how can we share information and these sort of things that there's already ideas out there flourishing in terms of, uh, of how can we all uh, solve this problem uh, through technology. But the first step I really think is the measurement part, right? Really, you know, if you're a company understanding how sustainability, like what is actually the, the impact of your supply chain uh, it's really interesting and then starting to actively plan with how can I mitigate the impact um, there's a lot of things probably you can look at um, you know we're talking a lot about here how do we sort of make the maritime sector uh, uh, how do we decarbonize that but there's already a lot of things I think that companies can do today also to just understand better what the impact of uh, individual supply chains are um, Technology helps a lot there, especially if you have the visibility in terms of how your, your business is impacting uh, the environment. Meta, I'd love to ask you, I know you work across a wide variety of technology and solutions within maritime decarbonization. Is there something in the next two to three years that you're especially excited about? I'm excited. I'm actually excited about where we are now, also, because if we look two to three years back, this like we're we've we've made it quite far. That doesn't mean that, but the the change in mindset that's already a big step forward. Or and the the positivity that I hear towards like we can do like there is a, a positive towards we can do. But I see th three things that are important for actually for for in, for for enabling this. And and for me, it's it's transparency. So it's that transparency about. Um, uh, um, emissions, but also transparency about using data better. So transparency in the in the supply chains. Um, it's how do we enable scaling? And, and here I, I just want to stress that even small contributions to that can also contribute to larger scaling. And so it's not only the steps from the from the very big companies that are able to 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 go big scale in on this. It's actually also smaller uh, contributions from uh, um, um, that all scales up. So, so how do we enable scaling with different mechanisms and, and in different segments and in different sizes of companies? Uh, and then it's uh, reduce the, the waste, uh, and, and especially because, as, uh, as Trina also just alluded to, the new fuels are going to be, it's not super sexy to talk, about, to talk about energy efficiency, but energy efficiency is, a, is, a, is, a, is an important pillar for, for long-term decarbonization because when you have a fuel product that is suddenly going to be three to four times more the price, hopefully that will be lower, you want to be using less. So that will have both the benefit of being less costly and also reducing your emissions. Uh, and hopefully some of those emissions can actually be reduced here and now with some of the 
efficiency technologies that are that are already uh, that are already available uh, today. Um, so I'm excited, but at the same time, I also think that it's one of the biggest transitions that the shipping industry and the broader the broader ecosystem around, because this is not something that the maritime classical maritime stakeholders or cargo owners will be solving for uh, by themselves. You need the involvement from the energy side. There's regulatory impact, but it, it's really it's a it's much more than a maritime um, uh, maritime um, um, challenge ahead, uh, and and hence also requires involvement from from many more stakeholders. But I'm excited because I think we're starting to see that. Uh, and I think that's something that will happen even more within the next three years. I'm also excited about that. And something I say regularly to customers I'm lucky enough to talk to is that no one party can decarbonize a supply chain alone or let alone the world. So it's one of my favorite parts about the work that we all get to do is that it has to be collaborative to make sure that we're making a difference. Um, shifting gears towards a subject area I'm sure a lot of our audience has questions on is financing a sustainable supply chain. So Jan Christoph, I'd love to direct this question to you first. What do you believe are some of the true costs of decarbonizing the maritime industry? And then I would love to open it up to both Trina and Meta to ask who will bear the burden of these costs? Yes, thank you. Um, well, for us in the beginning, it's very much important to look at how you can demonstrate it is possible to decarbonize whole maritime value chains, the so-called green corridors. And here, making things as concrete as possible, you also see, okay, where act lie, do the costs actually lie and who's actually then covering? And um, in the beginning, inevitably, like for many other transitions that we've seen uh, in the transportation sector, uh, for instance, building um, railways around the globe in the beginning, for instance, in Europe, uh, you could actually not build large railway uh, networks without also public stakeholders engaging in it and bearing some of the risk. So it's also very much de-risking the investments along the value chain. And here plays an important role that we get the right mix between public and private uh, side. So uh, in the beginning, uh, we see, for instance, here now in the European Union possibilities uh, through the European um, emission trading scheme where revenues will go to and are going now to the European Innovation Fund uh, so that those who are interested in decarbonizing parts of the value chain or the whole maritime value chain, including energy production, fuel production and uh, the ships, ports, etc., actually have a possibility to, to get money both for CAPEX and, and OPEX. Um, this is something that might help in the European Union, uh, but then we look also at, for instance, uh, in developing countries. Uh, let's take Namibia, where we have a, a green corridor project as the center. Um, there we also look at public possibilities. Are there, for instance, countries also that could help with development aid? Are there public banks that could help with guarantees to, to reduce the risk? But all this actually can't get things at scale if you don't get the private side investing in it. It's the private side that inevitably at the end will help to decarbonize the whole maritime sector. So therefore also in the first projects, we need to have significant private money on board as well. And who's willing to do that? Well, it's also those stakeholders who can see that if they engage in these projects, they actually also have a chance to form a future market, future regulation around this, and through this also getting advantage in things. But at the end of the day, it's also a dedication to our globe and planet and the surroundings of all of us to see that we actually can uh, keep the world in a shape that we can also give it in a good shape and pass it on to, to, to future generations. Uh, so in a nutshell, private public mix, absolutely important. At the end of the day, it will be the private money to get things going. But it's a daunting task. The fuel cost price gap is still very big, as Meta mentioned three to five times the price for the alternative fuels compared to fossil. And Meta, I've also known, I've heard you speak on this in the past. What is the cost for businesses not to take action today? The cost for business not to take action, well, for me, it's pretty clear. It, and especially if we sit here on, on Earth Day, but there's also, that's, that's, the, that's the one that's apparent to all of us, right? But uh, I also see it in the, in the, in the perspective of, 
of consumers also become much more aware of it, right? So the cost of not taking action is also is also making not irrelevant, but making making your making your product uh, less um, attractive uh, to the consumers. I do see that the consumers are are, are becoming uh, have been for a long time uh, very aware of this as well, and and I think actually Jan Christoph. Uh, touched upon this earlier also, and I'm not sure whether we should introduce another label, but it definitely comes back to that whole transparency, right? When you go down and buy something in the shop, do you know that it's been tra transported uh, sustainably or not? And would that impact your decision if you knew? Um, so so it, 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 it is at the core of, 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 of all the boardrooms, or it must be at the core of all the boardrooms if you want to stay relevant with your, with your product. Um, that, that's at least how I see it. Uh, and then it's a responsibility to, to our future generations as well. Um, but but I think there's there's nothing about like it's important to also recognize that there's nothing wrong with making a profit. It, it actually when we some of these transitions for for um, for to a new technology, that transition goes even faster when there's profit involved. So when when it's actually public, when 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 you can accelerate that transition because it's also demanded by the customers and there is an uh, there is a transparent way of also um, um, of also showing that the, that that is what the customer is is buying then 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 that's good as well because if anything in my world anything that can accelerate our transition is a good thing Thank you. And I know we've talked about transparency and accountability. Um, Trina, what do you think, um, where should businesses really start today when they think about taking action around their costs and supply chain planning? I think, um, so my experience, and of course, I don't know all companies, right? But I, I feel like there's still a lot of companies who are not necessarily taking the sustainability topic to the boardroom. So Riff, what you also just said, Mede, um, sustainability, uh, you know, also looking at, uh, at just the input we had, uh, is something that is a nice to have still. Um, I think a lot of companies should really start taking this into their strategy and have sustainability as part of their strategic goals, because I also think that would drive an, in, you know, different decision making about procurement or supplier networks or how do I actually operate my business more sustainably in the long term. And I think, you know, we've seen a lot of good examples over time where choosing the sustainable route is actually a lower cost, potentially. Um, we saw it with the whole slow steaming uh, from the carriers. Uh, so on a carrier side, by, you know, slowing ships down, you save a lot of fuel which is really good for the environment, but also reduces your cost quite significantly. So if you're a first mover in that space, that was also a very profitable move. So I, I think the two need to come hand in hand. Um, you know, it's something where it will be interesting if you can start really thinking strategically about sustainability, because if you can be a first mover, I think consumer sentiment is slowly changing. It's not 100% there, but I do feel that the younger generation in particular is extremely passionate about this and they are the future consumers. So I also think if you're a company, you have to consider the generational shift in expectations towards uh, companies. Uh, and at least I see the pressure rising there, which is good. Also because at the end of the day, consumers also need to be willing to pay additional, uh, at least in the short term, uh, if we want to see an acceleration of, uh, of some of the topics in the short term. Thank you. And thank you three so much for this thought provoking dialogue. Um, at this time, we'll actually open it up for some questions, a reminder to add questions to the Q&A function in the right hand side of the panel, and we'll work to answer as many as possible. And so with that, our first question is actually, how does the ISO 14083 standard fit in to our conversation today? Um, young Christoph, I'm happy to pass this one to you. Otherwise, I can take it as well. <laughs> happy. If you can start, then I, I can uh, supplement. 
Perfect. Um, the ISO 14083 standard is a new standard as of last year that was built on the foundation of what's called the Global Logistics Emissions Council, the GLEC framework. And it's basically a way within our industry to try and standardize emissions calculations. So as Jan Christoph mentioned earlier on in this dialogue, we really want to work towards a place where there's harmonized emissions calculation across both transportation and specifically maritime calculations. And so the ISO standard is helping establish that harmonization. Yes, and, and uh, well, on, on top of that, it's very much uh, the bringing the different parts of, of, of the uh, potential uh, to emit emissions together. Because right now the discussion is mentioned at, at IMO, if you measure what comes out of the chimney for green methanol, CO2 comes out of that and that you can measure and you may might have to pay for it. But then you also need to look at, okay, and what happened then on, on, on the land side? So that is uh, right now actually an enormous, enormous task uh, for IMO uh, to agree upon. And you also see um, advantages, but also challenges here. On the advantage side, um, IMO is actually able and one of the very few United Nations bodies that can regulate a whole industry sector. Mandatory. Uh, on the challenge side, uh, I participated in numerous discussions there. Uh, one of the bit more reluctant or, or critical uh, parties at IMO, they say, hey, um, we are a maritime organization, we can't regulate on the countryside, on the land side. Uh, so um, the IMO, the ISO helps quite a lot, uh, especially for those companies who are willing to engage in it. What gets the ball really rolling is if we get international regulation that makes it mandatory. And therefore, I really hope uh, that uh, that uh, this will manage uh, to be adopted uh, next year, because that would uh, allow for the customers also uh, to actually um, have much more security in their investments, their willingness to, to say, yes, we would go to the alternative fuels way. And maybe I can just add in there because another part of the, so, so having that, one of the things that when we looked at the fuel side is actually also that lack of product definition. So something when we operate in the shipping space where we know what a product is and we have product managers and everything, but it's actually one of the big challenges for this whole sustainability is the sustainability transition. It's also the fact that a lot of these uh, these concepts are not defined clearly as a product yet. What's the price of an 80% reduction versus a 70% reduction or a 90% reduction? So there's a there's a lot of things hinging also on on these IMO definitions actually really and, and the standards uh, um, um, helping us define those products in the market so a real pricing mechanism can, can really um, can start working across the entire value chain. So both both from the offtake of fuel, but also on the on the cargo side market of uh, of that pricing mechanism. So I think that whole standard standardization, well, standardization is always a it can always be a key driver. It's but it's one of the ones that's harder to actually execute on, right? And the fact that we have IMO in the shipping industry, uh, and they have ICAO in in, in aviation uh, is actually quite an advantage, even though it's sometimes seen as a little bit slow. Uh, but for industries where they don't have these uh, um, it, it becomes much more of a regional uh, regional regulatory game, right? So, so yes, it might be slower, but it's also very effective on a, on a longer term in creating real global and level playing field uh, standards. Absolutely. Um, another question that I'll direct first to Trina and then open up to the rest of our panelists. What is the first thing you would advise a commercial business to act on now? And I know we've talked a bit about this today. Yeah, so just to like sum it down, I think one, make sure that you have transparency. So measurements, um, do your best to make sure that it also aligns with the with standards. I think that's a really good point because that will also help you benchmark. Uh, and it's always good to see how you stand versus others. And the next one, which is very simple, is really starting to talk about all the decisions that you make strategically, how does it impact? sustainability. I think that's actually a very, you know, easy thing to do. And it doesn't always have to come with action. But at least it comes with, you know, I always talk about making decisions with eyes wide open. Um, and I think it's an angle. Um, that is just an interesting uh, topic to start bringing up. 
because maybe there's alternative paths uh, to the same objective, but that is more sustainable in its shape. Two very simple things. Well, maybe not the first one, by the way, because uh, hearing everything we've said today, it's not necessarily very easy uh, to, uh, to understand all the different aspects and legal requirements, and there's no standard, but uh, start somewhere in terms of measuring. I think that's the key message. And maybe I'll take over there because start somewhere is, is very much aligned to my message on like baby steps also count. So, so just starting is, is, is actually quite important. Uh, it, it doesn't it just need to be with scale just to, to get into it because it's also getting some experience on what works and what works for your specific supply chain. So, so baby, baby steps is also, is also a way forward, uh, in a, Inaction is almost the worst you can do, but but actually starting to make those baby steps gives you some learning and it also gives you maybe an opportunity to work with other companies or work through a consolidator or so. So baby steps is better than no steps. Thank you. And um, maybe on, on that one, uh, just one, one additional step. Once you did the baby steps and once you also looked at how measurements look like, then to us and that's also our advice to many of the shipping companies, but actually advice to all companies along the value chain. Look at ESG. Look at how you can implement ESG into your company and not just as a department that is somewhere uh, next to many other departments, but actually bring it into the heart chamber of strategic thinking in your company. And it will help you not only to, to become better, to work with sustainability, it actually demonstrates very often that your decisions will become better in the company. And on top, depending on where you are in the world, but if you're, for instance, in the European Union, then there is also some advantages because the European Union has more and more demands on ESG in a company. If you are not uh, producing something that could be seen as a green investment, if you want to loan money as a company on the market, if it's not green, then actually in the future, you will have to pay more money. And that is actually some very, very, very direct arguments to work with ESG and through that address decarbonization and sustainability. Thank you. Um, I know we are just about at time. I want to thank again our panelists for such a riveting conversation today and wish all our participants a happy Earth Day. Um, and that is it from FlexCord. So thank you again and have a lovely day. <laughs>